Chapter Two of El Dorado by Baroness Orsi. Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage in June two thousand and seven. Chapter Two, widely divergent aims. This was Armand Saint Just's first visit to Paris since that memorable day when first he decided to sever his connection from the Republican Party, of which he and his beautiful sister Marguerite had at one time been amongst the most noble, most enthusiastic followers. Already a year and a half ago, the excesses of the party had horrified him and that was long before they had degenerated into the sickening orgies which were culminating to-day in wholesale massacres and bloody hecatombs of innocent victims. With the death of Mirabeau, the moderate Republicans, whose sole and entirely pure aim had been to free the people of France from the autocratic tyranny of the Bourbons, saw the power go from their clean hands to the grimy ones of lustful demagogues, who knew no law save their own passions of bitter hatred against all classes that were not as self-seeking, as ferocious as themselves. It was no longer a question of a fight for political and religious liberty only, but one of class against class, man against man, and let the weaker look to himself. The weaker had proved himself to be, firstly, the man of property and substance, then the law-abiding citizen, lastly the man of action who had obtained for the people that very same liberty of thought and of belief, which soon became so terribly misused. Armand Saint Just, one of the apostles of liberty, fraternity, and equality, soon found that the most savage excesses of tyranny were being perpetrated in the name of those same ideals which he had worshipped. His sister Marguerite, happily married in England, was the final temptation which caused him to quit the country, the destinies of which he no longer could help to control. The spark of enthusiasm which he and the followers of Mirabeau had tried to kindle in the hearts of an oppressed people had turned to raging tongues of unquenchable flames. The taking of the Bastille had been the prelude to the massacres of September, and even the horror of these had since paled beside the holocausts of to-day. Armand, saved from the swift vengeance of the revolutionaries by the devotion of the Scarlet Pimpernel, crossed over to England, and enrolled himself under the banner of the heroic chief. But he had been unable hitherto to be an active member of the League. The chief was loath to allow him to run foolhardy risks. The saint Just, both Marguerite and Armand, were still very well known in Paris. Marguerite was not a woman easily forgotten, and her marriage with an English aristo did not please those republican circles who had looked upon her as their queen. Armand's secession from his party into the ranks of the émigrés had singled him out for special reprisals, if and whenever he could be got hold of, and both brother and sister had an unusually bitter enemy in their cousin Antoine Saint-Just, once an aspirant to Marguerite's hand, and now a servile adherent and imitator of Robespierre whose ferocious cruelty he tried to emulate, with a view to ingratiating himself with the most powerful man of the day. Nothing would have pleased Antoine Saint-Just more than the opportunity of showing his zeal and his patriotism by denouncing his own kith and kin to the tribunal of the terror, and the scarlet pimpernel, whose own slender fingers were held on the pulse of that reckless revolution, had no wish to sacrifice Armand's life deliberately, or even expose it to unnecessary dangers. Thus it was that more than a year had gone by before Armand Saint Just, an enthusiastic member of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel, was able to do aught for its service. He had chafed under the enforced restraint placed upon him by the prudence of his chief, when indeed he was longing to risk his life with the comrades whom he loved, and beside the leader whom he revered. At last, in the beginning of ninety four, he persuaded Blakeney to allow him to join the next expedition to France. What the principal aim of that expedition was, the members of the League did not know as yet. But what they did know was that perils, graver even than hitherto, would attend them on their way. The circumstances had become very different of late. At first the impenetrable mystery which had surrounded the personality of the chief had been a full measure of safety. But now one tiny corner of that veil of mystery had been lifted, by two rough pairs of hands at least. Chauvelin, ex-ambassador at the English court, was no longer in any doubt as to the identity of the Scarlet Pimpernel, whilst Collot d'Herbois had seen him at Boulogne, and had there been effectually foiled by him. Four months had gone by since that day, and the Scarlet Pimpernel was hardly ever out of France now. The massacres in Paris and in the provinces had multiplied with appalling rapidity. The necessity for the selfless devotion of that small band of heroes had become daily, hourly more pressing. They rallied round their chief with unbounded enthusiasm, and let it be admitted at once that the sporting instinct inherent in these English gentlemen made them all the more keen, all the more eager, now that the dangers which beset their expeditions were increased tenfold. 
At a word from the beloved leader, these young men, the spoilt darlings of society, would leave the gaieties, the pleasures, the luxuries of London or of Bath, and taking their lives in their hands, they placed them, together with their fortunes, and even their good names, at the service of the innocent and helpless victims of merciless tyranny. The married men, folks, my Lord Hastings, Sir Jeremiah Walscourt, left wife and children at a call from the chief, at the cry of the wretched. Armand, unattached and enthusiastic, had the right to demand that he should no longer be left behind. He had only been away a little over fifteen months, and yet he found Paris a different city from the one he had left immediately after the terrible massacres of September. An air of grim loneliness seemed to hang over her, despite the crowds that thronged her streets. The men whom he was wont to meet in public places fifteen months ago, friends and political allies, were no longer to be seen. Strange faces surrounded him on every side. Sullen, glowering faces, all wearing a certain air of horrified surprise and of vague, terrified wonder, as if life had become one awful puzzle, the answer to which must be found in the brief interval between the swift passages of death. Armand Saint Just, having settled his few simple belongings in the squalid lodgings which had been assigned to him, had started out after dark to wander somewhat aimlessly through the streets. Instinctively, he seemed to be searching for a familiar face, some one who would come to him out of that merry past which he had spent with Marguerite in their pretty apartment in the Rue Saint Honore. For an hour he wandered thus, and met no one whom he knew. At times it appeared to him as if he did recognize a face or figure that passed him swiftly by in the gloom. But even before he could fully make up his mind to that, the face or figure had already disappeared, gliding furtively down some narrow, unlighted by-street, without turning to look to right or left, as if dreading fuller recognition. Armand felt a total stranger in his own native city. The terrible hours of the execution on the Place de la Révolution were fortunately over. The tumbrils no longer rattled along the uneven pavements, nor did the death-cry of the unfortunate victims resound through the deserted streets. Armand was, on this first day of his arrival, spared the sight of this degradation of the once lovely city. But her desolation, her general appearance of shame-faced indigence, and of cruel aloofness, struck a chill in the young man's heart. It was no wonder, therefore, when anon he was wending his way slowly back to his lodging, he was accosted by a pleasant, cheerful voice, that he responded to it with alacrity. The voice, of a smooth, oily timbre, as if the owner kept it well greased for purposes of amiable speech, was like an echo of the past, when jolly, irresponsible Baron de Batz, erstwhile officer of the guard in the service of the late King, and since then known to be the most inveterate conspirator for the restoration of the monarchy, used to amuse Marguerite by his vapid, senseless plans for the overthrow of the newly risen power of the people. Armand was quite glad to meet him, and when de Batz suggested that a good talk over old times would be vastly agreeable, the younger man gladly acceded. The two men, though certainly not mistrustful of one another, did not seem to care to reveal to each other the place where they lodged. De Batz at once proposed the avance box of one of the theatres as being the safest place where old friends could talk, without fear of spying eyes or ears. "'There is no place so safe or so private nowadays, believe me, my young friend,' he said. "'I have tried every sort of nook and cranny in this accursed town, now riddled with spies, and I have come to the conclusion that a small avancem box is the most perfect den of privacy there is in the entire city. The voices of the actors on the stage, and the hum among the audience in the house, will effectually drown all individual conversation, to every ear save the one for whom it is intended.' It is not difficult to persuade a young man who feels lonely and somewhat forlorn in a large city to while away an evening in the companionship of a cheerful talker, and de Batz was essentially good company. His vapourings had always been amusing, but Armand now gave him credit for more seriousness of purpose, and though the chief had warned him against picking up acquaintances in Paris, the young man felt that that restriction would certainly not apply to a man like de Batz, whose hot partisanship of the royalist cause, and hair-brained schemes for its restoration, must make him at one with the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Armand accepted the other's cordial invitation. He too felt that he would indeed be safer from observation in a crowded theatre than in the streets. Among a closely packed throng bent on amusement, the sombrely clad figure of a young man with the appearance of a student or of a journalist would easily pass unperceived. But somehow, after the first ten minutes spent in de Batz's company, within the gloomy shelter of the small avance box, Armand already repented of the impulse which had prompted him to come to the theatre to-night, and to renew acquaintanceship with the ex-officer of the late King's Guard. 
Though he knew de Batz to be an ardent royalist, and even an active adherent of the monarchy, he was soon conscious of a vague sense of mistrust of this pompous, self-complacent individual, whose every utterance breathed selfish aims, rather than devotion to a forlorn cause. Therefore, when the curtain rose at last on the first act of Moliere's witty comedy, St. Just deliberately turned towards the stage, and tried to interest himself in the wordy quarrel between Philante and Alceste. But this attitude on the part of the younger man did not seem to suit his newly found friend. It was clear that de Batz did not consider the topic of conversation by any means exhausted, and that it had been more with a view to a discussion like the present interrupted one, that he had invited St. Just to come to the theatre with him to-night, rather than for the purpose of witnessing Mademoiselle Lange's debut in the part of Célimène. The presence of St. Just in Paris had as a matter of fact astonished de Batz not a little, and had set his intriguing brain busy on conjectures. It was in order to turn these conjectures into certainties that he had desired private talk with the young man. He waited silently now for a moment or two, his keen, small eyes resting with evident anxiety on Armand's averted head, his fingers still beating the impatient tattoo upon the velvet-covered cushion of the box. Then at the first movement of St. Just towards him, he was ready in an instant to reopen the subject under discussion. With a quick nod of his head he called his young friend's attention back to the men in the auditorium. "'Your good cousin Antoine St. Just is hand and glove with Robespierre now,' he said. "'When you left Paris more than a year ago, you could afford to despise him as an empty-headed windbag. Now, if you desire to remain in France, you will have to fear him as a power and a menace.' "'Yes. I knew that he had taken to herding with the wolves,' rejoined Armand lightly. "'At one time he was in love with my sister. I thank God that she never cared for him.' "'They say that he herds with the wolves because of this disappointment,' said de Batz. The whole pack is made up of men who have been disappointed, and who have nothing more to lose. When all these wolves will have devoured one another, then, and then only, can we hope for the restoration of the monarchy in France. And they will not turn on one another, whilst prey for their greed lies ready to their jaws. Your friend the Scarlet Pimpernel should feed this bloody revolution of ours, rather than starve it, if indeed he hates it as much as he seems to do." His restless eyes peered with eager interrogation into those of the younger man. He paused as if waiting for a reply. Then, as St. Just remained silent, he reiterated slowly, almost in the tones of a challenge, "'If, indeed, he hates this bloodthirsty revolution of ours, as he seems to do.' The reiteration implied a doubt. In a moment, St. Just's loyalty was up in arms. "'The Scarlet Pimpernel,' he said, "'cares not for your political aims. The work of mercy that he does, he does for justice and for humanity.' "'And for sport,' said de Batz with a sneer. "'So I have been told. He is English.' assented St. Just, and as such will never own to sentiment. Whatever be the motive, look at the result. Yes, a few lives stolen from the guillotine. Women and children, innocent victims, would have perished but for his devotion. The more innocent they are, the more helpless, the more pitiable, the louder their blood would have cried for reprisals against the wild beasts who sent them to their death. St. Just made no reply. It was obviously useless to attempt to argue with this man, whose political aims were as far apart from those of the Scarlet Pimpernel as was the North Pole from the South. "'If any of you have influence over that hot-headed leader of yours,' continued de Batz, unabashed by the silence of his friend, "'I wish to God you would exert it now.' "'In what way?' queried St. Just, smiling in spite of himself at the thought of his or any one else's control over Blakeney and his plans. It was de Batz's turn to be silent. He paused for a moment or two, then he asked abruptly, your Scarlet Pimpernel is in Paris now, is he not?" "'I cannot tell you,' replied Armand. "'Bah! There is no necessity to fence with me, my friend. The moment I set eyes on you this afternoon, I knew that you had not come to Paris alone.' "'You are mistaken, my good de Batz,' rejoined the young man earnestly. "'I came to Paris alone. Clever parrying on my word, but wholly wasted on my unbelieving ears. Did I not note at once that you did not seem over-pleased to-day when I accosted you? Again you are mistaken. I was very pleased to meet you, for I had felt singularly lonely all day, and was glad to shake a friend by the hand. What you took for displeasure was only surprise." "'Surprise? Ah, yes! I don't wonder that you were surprised to see me walking unmolested and openly in the streets of Paris, whereas you had heard of me as a dangerous conspirator, eh? And as a man who has the entire police of his country at his heels, on whose head there is a price, what? I knew that you had made several noble efforts to rescue the unfortunate King and Queen from the hands of these brutes. All of which efforts were unsuccessful, assented de Batz imperturbably, every one of them having been either betrayed by some damned confederate, or ferreted out by some astute spy eager for gain. 
Yes, my friend, I made several efforts to rescue King Louis and Queen Marie Antoinette from the scaffold, and every time I was foiled. And yet here I am, you see, unscathed and free. I walk about the streets boldly and talk to my friends as I meet them. You are lucky, said Saint Just, not without a tinge of sarcasm. I have been prudent, retorted de Batz. I have taken the trouble to make friends there where I thought I needed them most. The mammon of unrighteousness, you know what. And he laughed a broad, thick laugh of perfect self satisfaction. Yes, I know, rejoined Saint Just, with the tone of sarcasm still more apparent in his voice now. You have Austrian money at your disposal. Any amount, said the other complacently, and a great deal of it sticks to the grimy fingers of these patriotic makers of revolutions. Thus do I ensure my own safety. I buy it with the Emperor's money, and thus am I able to work for the restoration of the monarchy in France. Again Saint Just was silent. What could he say? Instinctively now, as the fleshy personality of the Gascon royalist seemed to spread itself out and to fill the tiny box with his ambitious schemes and his far reaching plans, Armand's thoughts flew back to that other plotter, the man with the pure and simple aims, the man whose slender fingers had never handled alien gold, but were ever there ready stretched out to the helpless and the weak, whilst his thoughts were only of the help that he might give them, but never of his own safety. De Batz, however, seemed blandly unconscious of any such disparaging thoughts in the mind of his young friend, for he continued quite amiably, even though a note of anxiety seemed to make itself felt now in his smooth voice. "'We advance slowly, but step by step, my good Saint Just,' he said. "'I have not been able to save the monarchy in the person of the King or the Queen, but I may yet do it in the person of the Dauphin.' "'The Dauphin,' murmured Saint Just, involuntarily. That involuntary murmur, scarcely audible, so soft was it, seemed in some way to satisfy de Batz, for the keenness of his gaze relaxed, and his fat fingers ceased their nervous, intermittent tattoo on the ledge of the box. "'Yes, the Dauphin,' he said, nodding his head as if in answer to his own thoughts, or rather, let me say, the reigning King of France, Louis the Seventeenth, by the grace of God, the most precious life at present upon the whole of this earth. "'You are right there, friend de Batz,' assented Armand fervently, "'the most precious life, as you say.' and one that must be saved at all costs." "'Yes,' said de Batz, calmly, "'but not by your friend the Scarlet Pimpernel.' "'Why not?' Scarce were those two little words out of Saint Just's mouth, and he repented of them. He bit his lip, and with a dark frown upon his face he turned almost defiantly towards his friend. But de Batz smiled with easy bonhomie. "'Ah, friend Armand,' he said, "'you are not cut out for diplomacy, nor yet for intrigue. So then,' he added more seriously, that gallant hero, the Scarlet Pimpernel, has hopes of rescuing our young king from the clutches of Simon the Cobbler, and of the herd of hyenas on the watch for his attenuated little corpse, eh?" "'I did not say that,' retorted Saint Just, sullenly. "'No, but I say it. Nay, nay, do not blame yourself, my over-loyal young friend. Could I, or any one else, doubt for a moment that sooner or later your romantic hero would turn his attention to the most pathetic sight in the whole of Europe, the child martyr of the temple prison? The wonder were to me if the Scarlet Pimpernel ignored our little king altogether for the sake of his subjects. No, no. Do not think for a moment that you have betrayed your friend's secret to me. When I met you so luckily to-day, I guessed at once that you were here under the banner of the enigmatical little red flower, and thus guessing, I even went a step further in my conjecture. The Scarlet Pimpernel is in Paris now in the hope of rescuing Louis the Seventeenth from the Temple Prison. If that is so, you must not only rejoice, but should be able to help. "'And yet, my friend, I do neither the one now, nor mean to do the other in the future,' said de Batz, placidly. "'I happen to be a Frenchman, you see. What has that to do with such a question?' "'Everything. Though you, Armand, despite that you are a Frenchman, too, do not look through my spectacles. Louis the Seventeenth is King of France, my good Saint Just. He must owe his freedom and his life to us Frenchmen, and to no one else.' "'That is sheer madness, man,' retorted Armand. Would you have the child perish for the sake of your own selfish ideas? You may call them selfish, if you will. All patriotism is, in a measure, selfish. What does the rest of the world care if we are a republic or a monarchy, an oligarchy or hopeless anarchy? We work for ourselves and to please ourselves, and I, for one, will not brook foreign interference. Yet you work with foreign money. That is another matter. I cannot get money in France, so I get it where I can. But I can arrange for the escape of Louis the Seventeenth. He is King of France, my good Saint Just. He must of France should belong the honour and glory of having saved our King. 
For the third time now St. Just allowed the conversation to drop. He was gazing wide-eyed, almost appalled, at this impudent display of well-nigh ferocious selfishness and vanity. De Batz, smiling and complacent, was leaning back in his chair, looking at his young friend with perfect contentment expressed in every line of his pock-marked face, and in the very attitude of his well-fed body. It was easy enough now to understand the remarkable immunity which this man was enjoying, despite the many foolhardy plots which he hatched, and which had up to now invariably come to naught. A regular braggart and empty windbag, he had taken but one good care, and that was of his own skin. Unlike other less fortunate royalists of France, he neither fought in the country nor braved dangers in town. He played a safer game, crossed the frontier, and constituted himself agent of Austria. He succeeded in gaining the Emperor's money for the good of the royalist cause, and for his own most especial benefit. Even a less astute man of the world than was Armand Saint Just would easily have guessed that de Batz's desire to be the only instrument in the rescue of the poor little Dauphin from the temple was not actuated by patriotism, but solely by greed. Obviously there was a rich reward waiting for him in Vienna, the day that he brought Louis the Seventeenth safely into Austrian territory. That reward he would miss if a meddlesome Englishman interfered in this affair. Whether in this wrangle he risked the life of the child king or not, mattered to him not at all. It was de Batz who was to get the reward, and whose welfare and prosperity mattered more than the most precious life in Europe. End of chapter 2